This is a new podcast called One Kick-Ass Bitch. It's going to be stories about women in history. When after you hear their story, you're going to say, That's that was one, one kick-ass kick ass bitch. <laughs> this is Ken, and I'm here with my friend Amber. And uh, I'm going to tell her a story, which she kind of knows a little bit about this. And then next week, she'll tell me a story I probably won't know anything about. And we'll, every week, back and forth, tell you guys about... Kick-ass bitches from... History. Different periods of history. Yeah. I'm going to stay away from, like, the Eileen Wernos and stuff like that. Yeah, well, because she's not particularly a kick-ass bitch. She does have a really interesting story, but she, even though she was traumatized and that led to her things, it doesn't excuse what she did. She's kind of a terrible person, so we'll just... Right, yeah. I'm, I'm going to go with, like, women who have kind of stood up to the, to the men. Yeah, and greatly impacted history. Yeah. And, like, you know, look at, okay, one of the people I want to do is Genghis Khan's daughter. He had all these sons and stuff, and he also had a daughter, but he didn't treat her any different than the than, men. Yeah. Than the men. And she ended up being just fucking. Yeah, she's actually kick-ass. one of my favorite badasses in history. So um, there you go. That's why we're doing this, because you got to, you know, a thing or two about a little bit of this. Actually, when we were discussing this podcast, I was like, I, I have a book about that. <laughs> you have an entire fucking book. <laughs> And other women I've been telling about this have been like, oh, have you heard about this person? Have you heard about that person? There's like, and there are other podcasts out there Mm -hmm. like this apparently, but I refuse to listen to them and because I don't want to get their influence. Yeah. You don't want anybody to say that's derivative of whatever. Like, oh, you're just stealing that person's idea and doing this, that, and the other. And it's like, no, maybe, but no. So we all had the same idea and you guys did it first, but like we didn't copy you. There you go. Because we might get hate. There might be yeah. that, oh, you guys are just ripping off such and such. And like, it. Scout's Honor, and it's legit, because I was a Girl Scout. We're not ripping you off. We haven't even heard your podcast, intentionally. And, and we're all we're all brothers, man. We're all yeah. even working. We're not, I'm trying to be better than anybody. We're and just sisters. doing our thing. Excuse and sisters. And sisters. See, there you go. This is why you're here. <laughs> I was going to do this podcast by myself, then I, like, read it, and I went, I listened to it, and I was like, this doesn't work. A As podcast a, about powerful women read by a and guy, read by men. Yeah, that doesn't really play, and that's why I put out the call to arms. And then you showed up, and we're like, "Hey, that sounds like." Hey, I like kick-ass bitches too. <laughs> who are we doing today? Do you know what we're doing today? We're doing Saint Olga. Saint Olga. Well, she she, was, I think she's she, technically not a saint. Is she actually a saint? She is. She was the okay. great Kevian princess Olga, princess of Kiev, Olga. When she became a saint, her name became Yelena. There is. So, I knew there was like a technicality. So people, I list, I did listen to one guy who did a podcast on her. It was like 20 minutes long and it was really, he had a lot of sound effects and it was not, I didn't like it because I liked the history part of it personally. But not like the DJ sound effects. Yeah. Like, yo, dog, check this out. Look what she did next. And I'm like, nah, maybe she did. Maybe she didn't. Not only that, um, I kind of bash on religion a little bit. Not a lot. And I don't really bash on it. Ken, you know I'm deeply religious. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I could tell by all these inverted crosses lying, <laughs> lying around your apartment. And the inverted <laughs> pentagrams on my kneecaps. You have pentagrams in your kneecaps? I do. Oh, yeah. I was wearing jeans last time I saw you. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, I don't bash, bash on it, but I just kind of point out some fallacies. No, I was totally kidding. I'm not religious at all. Thank God you were kidding. I wasn't so sure. But let's get the show on the road. Yeah. I did this in six parts, so we might actually break this podcast up in two, depending on how it goes. Right. Sounds good. Part one, I, I entitled... They bred the hate right into your fucking bones. We uh, have inserted some Zig into this podcast. The man. And I stuck with Zig. I didn't go past that. Thank you. That. No cat turds in no, this no, podcast. None of that. Thank you. I appreciate that. Because one thing about history is, and this is going to be a history podcast, not everyone wrote everything down. A lot of people back in the day didn't know how to write or flat out their language didn't have a written aspect to it. They would just talk. That's all it was. It was just a verbal language. I think a lot of Native Americans may have had mm-hmm. that also. That's why we don't know before. There's a great book called 1491 I'm dying to read because it's about what Mesoamerica was like before Columbus showed up. Because they didn't have a written 
they did to some extent, but that's that's we're on the other side of the planet here. <laughs> So basically, they would tell stories for generations until someone wrote it down. But by then, it would be telephoned to death. You played the game Telephone. Mm-hmm. You tell a story to somebody and blah, blah, blah. By the time it gets to the last person in the room. Suddenly, like, I called grandma, turned into I have a chicken sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> it would be, de- it'd be deviated from the original story so much, they'd end up with a story about a hippie walking on loaves of fish or some such shit. <laughs> <laughs> That yeah, was a little dig. Also, there was no year zero because zero wasn't a concept, and the guys who wrote everything down didn't have a symbol for it. They had a word; it was nil, and that was about it. And the guys I'm talking about were the Romans. They wrote everything down, and they wrote everything down in Latin or Guido speak, if you want to call it as such. <laughs> I know there were a lot of cultures that had written languages. The Chinese did. Um, the Muslims did. But we're not going to be talking about any of them. We're going to be talking about everything we're going to be talking about took place pretty much where the Romans were writing stuff down. Also, you're going to hear... It's all European history today. It's, yeah, we're going Eastern Eastern European, um, Earl Mountains area past that. Uh, Ukraine Okay, is basically okay. where we're at. Um, Perfect. You'll hear AD and CE used. AD means Anno Domini and CE is Common Era. So, again, people go, well, Common Era is, the reason we have years is because monks ended up starting to write everything down. And they always did everything year of our Lord. But then, okay, well, what if you're not of that religion? But we still had to have a point of reference. We'll see in this story that those numbers sometimes don't add up compared to what we know happened. And that's a big problem I had writing this story. I know there's some discrepancy between her year of her, like what's listed as her year of birth versus like when her son was born and all of that too. So that yeah. Oh, it, that, it, there. it gets crazy, on, especially on that one. Anyway. And it's off by like decades too. Oh, so. by yeah. Um, it, one, it's well, like I said, we'll get to it. Yeah. Anyway, the Holy Roman Catholic Empire, I mean, the Catholic, no, the Roman Empire. Again, people go, I'm a Catholic. The Catholic Church is nothing more than an extension of the Roman Empire, flat out. Eventually, way to increase their power, man. Uh-huh. It was a way to increase their power, it, yep, man. that's exactly it. That's exactly it, because they, again, we're not going to get into that and get into the whole... <laughs> ju- ju- that's a whole ju- other podcast. A whole friggin' thing in that area. Um, but anyway, so the, the Roman Empire got way too big and had to split themselves into the Western Holy Roman Catholic Mafia Empire of the Sopranos, which is the Western Empire. Because <laughs> it's all the Dagos that you run into, all the, the Guidos from New York and shit like that. That that flat out, when you run into Mafioso and shit like that, those were Romans. That's exactly how they were. They were bloodthirsty and cutthroat like that. Hats off to them, mad props. And then the Eastern side was um, also known as the Byzantine Empire. And we know when the Byzantine Empire came to being because, like I said, the Romans wrote everything down. And it says right here, Byzantine history goes, it begins. So the Eastern Roman Empire, when it became the Byzantine Empire, um, goes from the founding of Constantinople as its imperial residence on May 11th, 330 CE. We know the exact date. Why? Because they wrote everything down. That's really cool. And Constantinople is also known as Istanbul, and it's in Turkey. Yep, one of my best friends lives there. Really? Mm-hmm. Yeah, she's from Istanbul, and she moved back two years ago? Three years ago now. Oh, wow. That area is, like, so full of history. It's just, oh Yeah, my gosh. and they have a lot of really well-preserved, actually, Greek artifacts, mm-hmm. too. So, it's on my list of places I want to go. Yeah. I don't want like, woo, spring break vacation. I mean, I do want those kind of vacations too, but I want like history vacations and I want like... You go have fun. Mm -hmm. You learn stuff during the day and you party it up at night. That's how you do it. Exactly. So just to the north of the Byzantine Empire was a bunch of, well, I guess the best way to put it's like this. Motorhead. Motorhead lived north of the Byzantine Empire. Guys that looked like Lemmy and kicked almost as much ass. These were the Eastern Slavs, a whole mess of tribes with totally metal names, such as the uh, Dre- Dregovich. See if you, is that pronouncing that right? 
Yeah. Dragovix, Oryx, Radimix, Viacinth, Drevlians. These are the tribes that are running around just north of the Byzantine Empire. Now, ninth century. Just rocking tracksuits and Adidas, ruling shit up there. They were just, they were, you know, eight and a half feet tall. Beautiful. Friggin' these guys, I'm not really so sure. I'm thinking because what's going to happen next definitely turned them into the people you're thinking of. These people probably are more along the lines of, like I said, Motorhead, darker hair, big, huge, bruffy beards, beautiful. leather jackets, so beautiful. <laughs> Baseball bats with spikes in them, beating the crap out of each other all the time. They were just Dan Carlin. Burly, manly, like rough. Yeah. Dan Carlin does a podcast called um, Hardcore History, and he describes these people. Well, he describes the people to the west of there as kind of like how these people probably were, which is Hell's Angels. Because they were just, they were 10th century Hell's Angels. Mm -hmm. But at the time that this all stuff is going on, like I said, May 11th, 330 CE. So we're still before that. However, in the 9th century, either a branch of the Vikings, also known as Varangians, Vangarians, it's spelled like that, Varangians. So a branch of them called the Rus came down from the Baltic states and got these tribes to straighten their shit out because they were fighting stuff all the time. Tried to got, got them together. Yeah, they were just like, hey guys, get it together, organize it, let's do this in a better way because you could be like us, we're kicking ass right now. Right, and we got our shit together. We're not fighting against each other. We're fighting with each other. Yeah. It was either either that happened or a local tribe called the Rus got the other tribes to straighten their shit out and they were only briefly invaded by the Hungarians. Now you hear that. I'm going with the first option as the people of the Rus have been, the people of the Rus have been described as tall, blonde, ruddy complexion. Those are Vikings. Mm -hmm. Those aren't the Rus, but they are the Rus because the region. Like right. Regionally, they are. Rus means the people and or the land, like the area. Either way you slice it, you end up with Norwegian death metal motorhead. When you stop and think about it. Now, these are the people of the Rus, the Kevian Rus, the Kevian metal. They ran the trade routes through that area from the west and the north to the east and the south. Like Europe and Scandinavia to the Byzantines and the Caliphates, which are Muslim-controlled lands, and had the best parties if you survived. <laughs> so, in fact, if you're watching this on our YouTube channel, I can show you a map of kind of what this area looks like. In fact, you've got right here is Kiev, and it shows where the Drevlians are. It shows where the Polans are. It shows the Dragoviches. So that kind of is what the area looked like at the time. And if you move this, or maybe not because I'm moving the wrong thing. And I'm moving the wrong thing. <laughs> <laughs> but on this map, it will show you, there you go. Like, you know, there's Finland, there's Sweden. To kind of give you a rough idea of what things look like and how it was. And for those of you just listening to this, if I don't edit this out, grab a map. <laughs> Here's the earth around. And it's round. That is a sweet looking earth, you might say. Part two, death comes ripping. Now, living in this brutal metal world was a girl named Olga. While her birth date is unknown, it could be as early as 869. Or, nice. Or 890. Or June 5th, 925, which is oddly specific, but I did find that as a birth date. And that's the one really makes more sense as we go along in the story, but... Does it match up more with, like, the birth of her son and when he comes into power and all of that? Because I know that's where a lot of the discrepancy lies, because they're like, this one couldn't work since she would have been in her 60s when she had him, and that wasn't really a thing, and, like... Yeah, because when she, when she had Svenslav, um, and I have it in here somewhere, she had him in 942. So if you think about it, if she was born in 925, she would have been 18. Or 17. That lines up a lot more than having a child at 65. Or if she was born at 890, because people are going, oh, she was born at 890. I, well, still, that means she's kicking out a kid at 52 years old. Which is later ninth, than the average life expectancy at that point in history. <laughs> in 9th century Byzantine. Yeah. 
That's why I like the number 925 better. Yeah. But it doesn't add up with all the other shit. But that's okay. But, like, that could all be off, too, because, like we've talked about earlier, things weren't always written down properly. It was a lot of, like, oral legend. Especially with these people. Especially yeah. with the... Um, in that area, there is... The, with the Eastern Slavs, there's a book called The, um, the Great Chronicles, and it is basically like Encyclopedia Britannica of that area. But they didn't have written language. It wasn't written down till hundreds Much of years later. Much later. And it wasn't even necessarily written down by the people who had the stories passed on to them. It was written down by monks and people like that who had the ability to read and write. Right. So. But, you know, and then, well, we're going to come up with something else. With I just remembered another date that I'll be bringing up here later on. So 925 might not even work. Yeah. We'll Sorry, guys, we go off on a lot of tangents. Um, <laughs> because this is the kind of shit that's important. Yeah. If you want to know what the hell is going to happen in history, wouldn't you like to know kind of when? The dates, when it actually happened, or at least yeah, I mean, the best get, guesses of those dates? You get the story. Everybody's told the story. If you don't, you know, if you're listening to this, you probably already know the story. Or at least a part of it, or an aspect of it. Because mm-hmm. let me tell you what, even when we get into the gritty stuff... Those things, those fucking, those things changed also. I did a lot of reading. I've got like a bunch of sort sizes I have to sites I have to source sources I have to cite. Sources you, know you have to cite and sites yeah. you have to like list as a source. Both things were correct. There you go. You're good, man. <laughs> Don't a, fucking worry. I about haven't it. been in school in many years. There's a great age yeah, discrepancy. Yeah, Ken graduated but... in um 2004, so it's been a while. Yeah. <laughs> when did you graduate high school? 2006. I graduated in 91. Fuck. <laughs> there's, there's a bit of an age difference between us. Yeah. Uh, but still, we both like kick-ass bitches. Yeah. And uh, Glenn Danzig, as you can tell from the names of the sections of this podcast. Yes. The man. So, we're pretty sure that she has Varangian Vengar- roots. Viking, Viking roots. <laughs> as the name Olga is derived from the Scandinavian Old Norse word Helga. So there we go. Again, did the Rus come together because a tribe called the Rus brought them together or because a tribe of Vikings called the Rus came down and got them to get their shit together? Option. That option. Yeah, and I mean, as far as groups of, like, societies in that part of history, the Vikings were generally the most well-organized. They had i don't know more modern civilizations than anybody else like compared to i guess now they just had their shit together and the the thing is because when they took over this area and i said they were doing the trades how they were doing the trading was was along the rivers there's maps you can find that show what what tribes ran what sections of what river so when somebody from the east showed up with a bunch of silver and needed to get it to go into Europe somehow, they were like, give it to us. They would obviously probably take mm-hmm. their cut and then move it along. And depending on, there's a lot of times they were fighting was because the Romans were jumping in there going, no, 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 we want to do this. They were fighting with Byzantine all the fucking time. Like, get out of here. We're we going to run these this. trade routes. Plus they were getting the money from doing it. You know, yeah. and the, the Romans were like, fuck that. We want to get paid for doing that. Mm-hmm. But a lot of times they just made treaties and they eventually just got along with the Romans and we're able to manage manage it for mm-hmm. them. Now, the other version of her background is uh, other historical versions state that Olga was the daughter daughter of Oleg Veshki, the founder of the state of the Kievan Rus, the guy who brought the Rus together. Oleg Veshni probably initiated Olga's marriage with Prince Igor, who was the son of the Novogord Prince Ruik a founder of the Ruik dynasty of the Russian czars. So, again, I have to go back to this map. And that would make more sense for her to have enough status to marry a prince, And if you look at this, so we have Kiev is right here. Kiev is kind of in the south of the Rus. Up to the north is Peskov, which is where they think she's from, which is there. Novogord is just to the northeast of Peskov, and that is probably where... um, What's his name? Um, Ruik is from. And Ruik's son, Igor, now we've got, is from there. But Oleg, since he headed up 
Ki the Kievian Rus probably lived in Kiev. So if she was Oleg's daughter, she would have been living in Kiev already. Not Peskov, as some places say she was. But in order to get this city to the south and this city to the north to kind of like get together, you're going to have the guy in the north is going to get his son and be like to the guy in the south, hey, I've got a son, you've got a daughter, they should get married. Yeah. Kind of unites it. If you look at that map, that makes sense. At least that's what I think. And that's just my opinion. I could be wrong. Are we going to have that map on YouTube? This video is going to be on, on YouTube. There? Okay, yeah. great. If you're so, listening to it on YouTube, they'll see this. You guys can see the regions we were just discussing. And also trying to describe it for those of you driving in your car to work going, yeah. what the hell? They keep showing damn maps. I can't see a thing. Just close your eyes. No, don't. You're driving. Yeah, no. please don't. <laughs> Disclaimer. <laughs> we Which, do not actually want you to close your eyes. So, which with everything I've been reading makes sense, makes more sense than her being some random girl who married Prince MacGuffin around 903. Uh, MacGuffin is an object or device in a movie or a book that serves merely as a trigger for the plot. Did you know that? No, I didn't. There you go, a MacGuffin. Now I have another thing to file away in my Encyclopedia of Useless Knowledge, also known as the good old brain. <laughs> oh, the stuff between your ears. But again, we have her marriage date, 903. If she was born in 890, she was 13 when she got married. I mean, not at the entirely time, uncommon in history. Right. We don't know how old he was, though. Actually, I take that back. I could have looked it up. I went down a rabbit hole so fucking hard reading this, researching this. I never got around to it. Yeah. Ken was also wasted on cold medicine while he was doing this research, guys. So I've had. But I think he did a great job. The bron well, thank you. I've had the, kind, the chitis of the bronch. So, Prince Igor, also known as Igvar Rukskin, Igor of Kiev. the itis of the Bronx. Itis, itis of the Bronx. Yeah, not the chitis, not the, the Bronx, itis. The chitis? The itis. Chitis. Itis. No, just itis. Itis. Oh, no, okay. Just, Do you know who chitis? No, Do you know who chitis is? No. Or chitis? Or is it chitis? Chitis, I'm bored. Give me something to play with. I have something here for you. What is it this? Is I called, know this. It's called the Earth. What is this? I know this. Flash Gordon. Okay. It's one of the greatest movies of all yeah, time. Yeah, that's why I'm like, this sounds familiar in my brain. I have a signed Sam J. Jones action figure. Me and my buddy Jay each bought one. His is in his office at his, his fucking high-end banking job. You go into his office and there's a fucking <laughs> Sam J. Jones action figure signed. Yeah. Sorry, I'm not speaking. I'm just all facial expressions. <laughs> I, I'm realizing I need to like... Like externally, what the hell? It's like, yeah, we're old. We've it's got fucking some rad. Fucking, we still act like we're twelve. Um, never grow up. Never grow up. Never surrender. So they did have a son named Svitsilov. He was born in 942. That supposedly is set in stone. People are like, he was definitely born at this date. Okay, then if she was born in 925, that makes sense. But how did she get married in 903? That doesn't make sense. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. Years all over the place. Well, and I mean, technically, like, she could have gotten married but not gone to live with him yet until she came of age, if that's the discrepancy there. Because is the issue with that one that she would have been too young? Because well, if... she wasn't born yet. Oh. <laughs> 12 years before oh, she was born. Okay. 20, 22 years before okay. she was born. I um, I mixed up which date was which. I was, I was thinking it was the one of her being, like, a kid. Um, Yeah, that doesn't work. No. All right, I'm going to do so much deep Googling tonight, it's you guys. Cool. Believe me, <laughs> I got a list for you. Um, yeah, just give me, just email me a copy of your notes, oh, please. Not Thanks. A but we do know this. In 940, well, again, do we know it was 945? So we've been told. All we know is that we don't know anything. All we know is that we don't know. All we know is that we don't know nothing. In 945, Prince Igor went to collect tribute from the Drevlians. They. They were west of the city, and if you again saw the map that I pulled up earlier, they're just they're west of Kiev, uh, and their name loosely means the dwellers of the forest. They're kind of like Ewoks, at least from what I can tell. That's how they were pretty much treated. My dog looks like an Ewok. My dog does look like an Ewok. A dog zonked out over here. <laughs> the Drevlians, when not fighting with the Pol Polanians, who the, or the Polans, who I showed you, they were just south mm -hmm. of them who their name loosely means the dwellers in the fields. 
So the forest people and the field people didn't like each other and used to <laughs> fight. I find it fucking hilarious. I think he's like, so, hey, what's going on, man? Hey, how you doing? Yeah, what are you doing tonight? Oh, I hang out in the trees there in the forest. Like, why would you do that? We got a field over here. Why would you hang out in the field? You barbarian, fuck you. And it would fuck start you, field-dwelling bitches. Fuck you, you fucking forest people. They're just like, the field guys are whipping the forest guys with stalks of wheat, and the forest guys are just like smacking them with tree branches, and like throwing random fungi at them. Like, you are not a very fun guy <laughs> hanging out in the field. Take that. They weren't even smart enough to build shit up under the trees. They would dig holes. They probably didn't want to dig, build shit up under the trees like the Ewoks did because what happens if you fall? Yeah, well, You're and fucked. it was probably easier to, like, insulate things down in the ground because I imagine it was probably pretty cold oh, in the it's, winter it's there. A, it's, it's a bit chilly. Yeah, a bit. <laughs> so it was probably easier to insulate. Maybe that was a smarter thing, Ken. Did you ever think about that? I didn't, no, I didn't, I didn't no, think you about didn't. No, I didn't. You never think. I never think. I just act. And this is why we're getting a divorce, Ken. <laughs> Not again. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, when the Drevlians weren't fighting with the Pollens, they would fuck with the Roos. The, the whole Kebby and Roos, because they didn't want to be part of it. They had their own thing going, and they were fine and happy and leave us alone, damn it. But in 883, they were made to start paying tribute to the to Kiev by Prince Oleg of Norvigord. How? I have no fucking clue. But this wait a minute. A tribute. But why did Prince Oleg of Norvigord, who we've affirmed is up north, who we've also heard that's where Ruik lived, and Oleg actually was running Kiev. Why does it say Oleg of Novogord instead of Oleg of Kiev? Do you want me to do some quick Googling? That's, no, that's, that's okay. That's okay. Right. I'm just telling you, when you go through all these sources, you'll read one source that'll say something completely different. You read another source that says this. It's so very conflicting. That's, it is very conflicting. Scholars, get your shit together. I accidentally on purpose did it this way. Perfect. To kind of like go to show people, hey, if shit isn't written down. We got to guess. Also, it may be because I jammed this so fucking hard and fast in like three days of research because I was sick for a fucking week. Instead of spending a week on this like I was planning on, no. I didn't have that luxury. Well, fuck your bronchitis. How about that? F fucking bronchitis. So anyway, in 907, they teamed up with the Rus to fight the Byzantines. Like I said, how they're always like trying to get the trade routes and shit going. And the Byzantines are always fucking with them. So they did eventually team up with the Ruse to fight them. However, Oleg dies in 912. So when this happens, they're not paying Kiev their tribute anymore. This other fucking guy who I think was a Dreglian. Dreg yeah, Ooh, Dreg this is the part. This is one of my favorite. Actually, I think we're getting into the part of her life that I'm really interested in. I think in. We're, we're, we might be heading there. So this guy named Sveneld, he swoops in and he's like, hey, you guys can start paying me. So he had no Sven. This, if you're looking for someone to pay. If you're looking for someone to say, hey, you guys are paying them, pay me instead. We'll we'll protect you. Oleg just died. They won't be able to, they don't know who in the fuck's running that place anymore. Here, pay me. We'll take care of you. Don't worry about it. It's, it was a big protection racket is all yeah. it really was. So. The Svenkal guy, he also had other tribes paying him. It was getting to be kind of a big deal. So Igor had to get the Ewoks to start paying him his cut to get Sven, to cut back on Svengal's rising power. So Igor's like, when he realizes what the fuck's going on, he's like, wait a minute, time out. All these fucking tribes are paying the Svengal guy. They're not paying us. Or maybe they were paying him and the other guy. Maybe mm -hmm. they were double dipping. So, and that's one of the stories I heard is that Igor, he so Igor basically went to Iskoroskin, which is the Drevlian capital. In modern day, it's called Koroskin. It's okay. the city's still there. Well, well, we'll find out. We'll find out exactly how much of the city is there when the story is over. Yeah. Um, so or so Igor tells tells the Drevlians it's time to pay up. Like, hey, you guys gotta start paying me. And they were like, who is this Igor asshole? We just already fucking paid Svengeld. We're not going to pay him. Yeah, we're not paying everybody. And yeah, and so they say, fuck you. And this is how Slavic tribes from the 10th century say, fuck you. 
Leo the Deacon, a Byzantine chronologer. Chronologer. Remember I said they wrote everything down? Mm -hmm. Leo the Deacon wrote down exactly what happened to Igor when he went to the Drevlians and said, give us money. Remember, these are tree people, which after I find out they are tree people makes the story even better. They had bent down true two birch trees to the prince's feet and tied them to his legs. Then they let the trees straighten again, thus tearing the prince's body apart. How cute the Ewoks are trying to be Wookiees. Mm, yeah. Now that's pretty Tough. metal, right? 10th century slobs, you gotta love them. When I said death comes ripping, that's why I called it. Yeah. Death comes ripping. Death really came ripping. But now the burden of government falls upon the widow of Igor. Part three. Part three. So now Olga's running the place. Her Well, technically her son is, but he's not old enough to do anything. Yeah, so she's, she's running it. She's regent is what it's known yeah. as. But part What's... three is called, I got something to say. Bow, bow, bow. There you go. So I got something to say. So Drevlians, they were run, their head guy, his name is Prince Maul. Sounds like a fellow of a Star Wars movie. Head of the Ewoks, Wookiee wannabes. Darth Maul, <laughs> Prince of the Ewoks. That's not how this story goes. <laughs> He's single, hairy, thinks himself a bit of the old ass kicker, and there just so happens to be a new single lady in the area. All the single ladies. All the single ladies. At this time, it was common if a ruler got killed, his widow would be bombarded with marriage proposals immediately. You know, because she's grieving and weak. And, I mean, all women are weak, right? Duh. It's the even, best time to slide into those DMs. Even, you know, she's mourning. <laughs> <laughs> hey, girl. That's exactly what it Even more so because her husband's dead. <laughs> Since Mal's the one that killed her husband, he obviously is the better man. So she should marry him. Then this wouldn't... Then his people wouldn't have to pay tribute to the Kevian Roos or Svengald. It was a total power play. Because this is how the people thought back yeah. then. He's big. Hey, I'm big. I'm strong. I'm bigger than him. I'm better than I him. I killed your husband. <laughs> you should be my wife now. So Prince Maul got 20 of his best men. Again, sources vary on what they mean by best men, but you'd have to assume he probably got emissaries, wise men, the kind of guys that could convince a grieving widow to marry the guy that killed her husband. You guys, this this part of the story is where Olga becomes a real kick-ass bitch. This is my favorite. No, this is where she becomes, she, she gets kick-ass. She's becoming a kick-ass Yeah, this is where she becomes. You know this is in four parts, right? Uh-huh. She does four things? Yeah, okay. this is where, but this is where she becomes. This is where, yeah. yeah. the beginning of her kick-assery. So, so he's 20 guys show up in Kiev and basically say Prince Maul's big and strong and he doesn't like to be bullied. He's a big tough Wookiee, not a lowly Ewok. To prove that he to prove that he killed Igor. Now, if you want your kingdom protected and safe and all that, would it be a good idea to marry him? Whoop whoop. How this played out is anyone's guess, as there are several different versions, but Thomas J. Crogwell in his book, How the Barbarian Invasions Shaped the Modern World, I feel tells it the best. Not only that, but that is like one of the greatest fucking titles of a book. Yes. So it's from it's from a section of his book called The Assassin's Ambassadors. It was commonplace during the Middle Ages for royal widows to receive offers of marriage while they were still in mourning. What made Olga, Princess of Kiev's case, remarkable was that the marriage proposal came from the man who had murdered her husband. The messengers had barely brought Olga the tragic news of her husband's death when an embassy of 20 distinguished chiefs from Amal, the Prince of the Drevlians, arrived at Olga's gates. They assumed that Olga, as a widow with a young son, would be feeling frightened and vulnerable, and this assumption made the Drevlian ambassadors bold. Once they were shown into the Prince's presence, they admitted candidly that their people had indeed assassinated Olga's husband Igor. Pushing the bounds of good sense as well as good taste, they asserted that Igor deserved what he got, that to the Drevlians he was like a wolf, crafty and ravishing. Like some people think he was double du double dipping. That's another thing yeah. they read. They were like, this, we already fucking paid these other guys. Like this guy was just fucking greedy coming for more money. But why dwell upon the unhappy events of the past, they said, when Prince Maul was so eager to make Olga his wife? Whatever sense of outrage she may have felt at this moment, Olga suppressed it. Forcing herself to appear agreeable, she replied, Your proposal is pleasing to me. Indeed, my husband cannot rise again from the dead, 
Of course, she would want time to consider the prince's offer. If the ambassadors returned the next day, she would give them her answer. Smiling, the Drevlians agreed and bowed deeply. They felt old and and bowing deeply, they left Olga's citadel. Once they were gone, Olga ordered her servants to go outside and dig a deep trench beside the stronghold. By morning, the pit was finished, and soon thereafter, the Drevlian ambassadors returned, dressed in their finest garments, a token of respect to the woman who, they were certain, was about to consent to be their princess. Rather than speak of marriage, however, Olga commanded her guards to drag the Drevlians outside and toss them into the pit. From the edge of the hole, Olga called down to the ambassadors and asked how they were enjoying their visit to Kiev. <laughs> Our case, they cried, is worse than Igor's. Then Olga gestured to her servants and he began to shovel dirt into the ditch, burying the 20 ambassadors alive. Now, I heard a different version of this. In fact, there are different versions of this. Another version was the guys show up. She goes, let me think about it. There's a lake over there. I got my boats on the lake. You guys go crash out on the boat. I have an answer for you in the morning. The next morning, the ambassadors wake up because the boat's shaking. And the townspeople are carrying the boat through the town. And they're like, this is pretty badass. Well, they've been digging a hole the whole night. And they threw the boat into the hole and then buried them all alive. I've also heard where they showed up on boats and she goes, well, come back. And then they come back, you know, the next day, like here. Mm -hmm. And when they, sh they showed up on their boats, because again, river people, remember? Yeah. And they were like, oh, we'll carry you through the town. So the, these ambassadors are on their boats. They feel two, like they're super important. Yep. It was, it was two boats, you know, 10 guys each being carried through the town. Like, hey, this is pretty awesome. They really like us. Look at this. They're carrying it. And then threw them into the hole and buried them alive. Either way you look at it. The point being, she and buried... there's also the bathhouse version of it. Oh no, that's that's next. Oh, yeah, the bathhouse is oh, next. Oh yeah, yeah, it was the best and wisest out of the way, and then. So she buried these twenty guys alive. These Revelians may be metal, but she's pretty metal too. Part four. Let's test your threshold of pain. Let's see how long you last. I love that song. Yeah. In fact, I was listening to the song when I was writing it, and I was like. Oh, that line works. <laughs> she gets word back to Prince Maul that the proposal makes sense. She'll go to Iskoristan and marry him, but only if Maul sends his best soldiers to <laughs> accompany her. She gives some excuse like, you need to show everyone how important I am to you by protecting me with your biggest, toughest guys. Oh, and have a feast waiting with all of your top people there. I can't seem to find anything regarding Maul not recognizing his emissaries haven't returned, only that she sent word to Maul. Did she send her own emissary saying, your guys will come back with her when we're all protected by your big strong men? Or like, they're just having such a great time here? Yeah, who knows? Maybe she tied it to the feet of a bird or something? I don't yeah. know. But she got word to him somehow. He was not suspicious at all. I don't get that. Well, but... Prince Maul's meathead like thought process isn't exactly the most observant, really. If you think about it, the dude's thinking with his dick here a lot because he gets his best soldiers, uber Norwegian death metal motorheads, and sends them to Kiev to gather up his wife to be. He just does it. No thinking, no nothing. She's coming right on. She must have been a pretty hot piece of ass. Yeah, like Olga had to have been a mega babe on what? top of being smart and like just super brave and like strong she was also a babe i guess and probably so. really did love her husband yeah actually I, loved like it was yeah an arranged marriage for how much like the wrath that yeah because we're about to hit stage number two <laughs> da -da 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 -da. <laughs> level two <laughs> so anyway they get to these so these these fucking soldiers i don't know how many he sent but he sent soldiers Again, I read tw some stories I read said 20, but mm -hmm. then the emissary 20, that makes more sense. So he just basically sent his biggest, toughest guys. They get to Kiev, Olga's waiting, all smiles, and she's like, oh, thank thankfully you made it here okay. I bet you're tired and need a nice hot bath. Here, give me those heavy weapons and that armor. We'll take care of that for you. I've had my people prepare a bathhouse for you. So just go in there, relax, and then we'll leave in a bit. 
So the biggest, bravest, probably hairiest, toughest of Prince Maul's men go into the bathhouse, Olga prepared for them, without their weapons, without their armor. And once the doors are locked from the outside, when they get in there, they lock the doors from the outside, and she lights the place on fire. I it, just imagine her, like, walking away, and there's just, like, hip-hop music playing, and she just, like, drops whatever she <laughs> lit it on fire with, and just, like, slow motion, like... Oh. Part five. There's some kind of love, and there's some kind of hate. Here's a quote I've got. Here's a... Uh, well, listen, it says, Olga the Beautiful. In 921, an emissary from the Caliph of Baghdad, Ahmed Ibn Falfin, visited Olga and Igor's realm. He was impressed by the Rus of the Kiev. Their height, their superb physiques, their yellow hair and ruddy complexions, which is as close as we can get to a general description of Olga. Now, this guy went there in 921. He didn't necessarily visit Olga and, and Igor. Because I'm still thinking she was born in 925. I'm kind of sticking with that for some reason. But the people of the area. That guy just described Vikings. Yeah. Flat out. Yeah. And the reason I put that there is because I, in my head, she's not going to her scores then. She's got all the weapons, all the armor from those guys who show it up. And she's probably wearing a black leather jacket covered in spikes with like the death metal black yeah, eyes like, and the white face. Olga <laughs> didn't come to play. Like she's here to burn churches. <laughs> I mean, she actually brought Christianity. But you know what I mean. You get the reference. She's here to burn churches. <laughs> oh my god. Ugh. One of my friends from actually a dancing group shared a really good meme about Valentine's Day. I'll show it to you when we're done because it's okay. super unrelated and we should get on a crazy <laughs> tangent. Um, but it's like a death metal church burning meme about Valentine's Day. It's like a Valentine's Day card. Oh my god. So anyway, sources say there was to be a funeral feast for Igor. Whether or not that's true, the fact is there was a feast. I'd like to think that she had her men wearing the armor and carrying the weapons of Prince Maul's toughest guys as maybe like a disguise or something. I know if I was making this a movie, that's what I would do. Yeah, they would just all be dressed in the other guy's armor. That way he's like, why aren't there any people here in my colors and stuff? Like, what is this? Right. But no, it's her guys dressed up in his yeah, colors. That's, yeah. Yeah. So probably, probably over-exaggerated numbers say there were 5,000 people at this feast. This is the number I've read from multiple sources, actually. But all those sources are like, not all of them say it, but several of them are like 5,000 people. They say, the Great Chronicles say there were 5,000 people. That's a lot of... That's a lot of fucking people. And it was all the top guys, their families. Hey, this is going to be our new princess. We got to show her we're grateful and all that. Besides, we're probably going to be living in Kiev now. la di da You know, I heard they have a lake there. Yeah. <laughs> So you can see it. A great hall. This is, is, is Gorosten, the Drevlian headquarters. They got their great hall. It's filled with barbarian royalty. And in walks Olga, blonde, eight and a half feet tall, smoking hot, flanked by Prince Maul's big, tough barbarian brutes that he sent to protect her. And once they're in, the doors to the great hall, you can hear them just getting closed, just thug shut. And you can hear the lock, the chink of the lock because no one's getting in or out. She wasn't locked in there with them. They were locked in there with her. With her. Like I said, probably over-exaggerated numbers, but 5,000 people were slaughtered by the great princess that day. The emissaries all I burned alive. I did not come to play with you hoes. I came to slay. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> Literally. I love it. Emissaries were all buried alive. The biggest, strongest warriors all burned to death. Every aristocrat, politician, head of state, and wherever else tribal barbarians had in the way of a big wig goes, all dead. I killed your husband. We should get married, they said. Fuck you is what she said, Kiev style. The smartest, the strongest, those in power, slaughtered. She had to have loved her husband. Is the only thing I can think. Yeah, I mean... You know, you think arranged marriage, you think it's going to be cold and, like, whatever. But 
clearly there was something, even if it was just a deep sense of loyalty. I don't know if maybe it wasn't romantic love, but it sounds like it was. Also, how did she... She killed thousands of people brutally for him. At this point right now, we're in the thousands. Yeah. We're in the fucking thousands. Not only that... You have to think this. And to protect, you know, her family, her legacy, her lands. Because if she remarries and she has an heir from, like, a previous marriage, are they going to be like, well, fuck your son. Like, you need to have mine and not yours because then he could inherit lands that are now mine through this marriage. And And, and and that is something else to consider. But also, we have to look at the way the marriage was where her dad probably ran Kiev and then Igor's dad probably ran Novogord. Or vice versa. Mm-hmm. So that's why we looked at the map. We had the north, the city, and north city, and the south arranged marriage. But at the same time, who thinks of buried people alive and burn people alive? Vikings think of shit like that. And she's clearly has seen this happen before, has heard tales of this happen before. I don't think she just came up with this idea. Yeah. She wasn't just like. Hopefully, I don't imagine anyways, just like this twisted person who was like, I want to kill all these people and like, I'm going to do it in these ways. I just am inspired to murder. No, that would be Elizabeth Bathory. Yeah. I just listened to a podcast about her. I've already known about I have an action figure yeah. with her. Yeah. Yeah. Which well, she's in the bathtub. I got the, the Faces I, of Madness ones. Yeah, I got, the nip, I got the nipple slip edition. I, I used to have that one, but an ex kept it. Whatever. I was cleaning out my shit. I found it. It's like broken. I Different story I for a different both time. versions of her. I had one that was in a box and ended up selling with the nipple slip. Yeah, because well, with the nip slip, they were worth like, a like lot. 60 bucks, 80 bucks, something like that. It was crazy. So, anyway, <laughs> here we are deviating again. Yeah. Talking about our toys. Action figures. <sighs> I got so fucking many. So, but anyway, yeah, so she knew about these methods of execution somehow. Probably just because she was a Viking. Yeah. It's the only way I can think about it. But here it is, the final chapter. Oral tradition passed down. Like, Oral. This is what we do to people who fuck with us. Yep. This is how it happens, motherfucker. We Viking them. Last chapter, chapter six, is called I'll Be Seeing You in Hell. What's the song? Die, Die, My Darling. Mm-hmm. That was it. I couldn't remember. I was asking because I was like, What's? "Oh, I thought you were just like." I was like, "No." At first, I was I like, "I thought it was rhetorical." Oh, I didn't realize you were. It, no, sorry. it wasn't. But then it became rhetorical once I said it, and then I remembered what it was from. Anyway, so but now here's the thing: everybody's dead, but the tribe itself, the Drevlians, they still remain, and their city is still there. So she's just chopped off the head, basically. The Drevlians were now just a people, and they were fucking terrified. They pled to be spared. They didn't kill her husband. Those bastards did. And you took care of them. So yeah, let's just call it even bounce. Okay, we're cool, right? Now, earlier I had mentioned, maybe I didn't. Yeah, I had. I talked about the Primary Chronicles. It's a book that tells the history of this area. This is what the Primary Chronicles has to say about what happens next. Because Olga is now about to go from being kick-ass to one kick-ass bitch. The people have come to her, scared as hell. No one to lead them. Just freaking the fuck out, and Olga tells them, quote, Give me three pigeons and three sparrows from each house. I do not desire to impose a heavy tribute like my husband, but I require only this small gift from you, for you are impoverished by our siege. Because another story was that the feast happened back in Kiev, and it killed everybody, then sieged the city. Oh, and then the wow. people came out and were like, Help, help, help. And she goes, tell you what, we're sieging you. We understand. Yeah. Just give us birds. Again, two different versions. The last version I told, I like better with her walking in. Well, and even and the, if that was the version, to pay for all of that, they probably taxed the freaking heck out of all the people in their lands to be able to pay for a feast for thousands of people. Yeah. So, I mean. Either way. It could work. Like I said, two different versions. Every time you turn around. Turn around. Every every now now and then. (laughs) Sorry. I did that. I did the Dan Band version of that song. Yeah. At a company. At a company. I was working for this fucking law firm. (laughs) Big fucking law firm. And they were like, do karaoke. And I got drunk enough. I was like, 
totally eclipse of the heart. And I started screaming fucking shit the whole time. That's so good. <laughs> Everybody laughed. Thank God I just started working there. I mean, hopefully they had seen the movie too and they got what I, you were. I, I don't know. These people were a bit, they were lawyers. Anyway. <laughs> um, so Olga's telling the people, give me birds. Um, and then it says, quote, now Olga gave to each soldier in her army a pigeon or a sparrow and ordered them to attach by thread to each pigeon and sparrow a piece of ember bound with small pieces of cloth. The actual translation reads a piece of sulfur bound with small piece of cloth. So I read that and I was like, sulfur, that doesn't make any sense. The translation gets fucked up when it goes to English. And it literally means... It means sulfur, but they're like, they don't, that word that they use is interchangeable and it could be, it could mean ember. So they basically got a piece of hot coal, wrapped it in cloth, tied a string to that little burning piece of stuff that was wrapped in cloth and then tied the string to the bird's feet. That's how it happens. So then when night fell, Olga bade her soldiers release the pigeons and the sparrows. So the birds flew to their nests, the pigeons to the coats the sparrows under the eaves, the dovecoats, the coops, the porches, and the haymows were set on fire. I don't know. What, what the fuck's a haymow? Is that a pile of hay? I guess, yeah. Uh, the, 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 the primary chronicle, that book. Let me, let me look it up for you. It says haymows. They were all set on fire. There was not a house that was not consumed, and it was impossible to extinguish the flames because all the houses caught on fire at once. The people fled from the city, and Olga ordered her soldiers to catch them. Thus, she took the city and burned it, and captured the elders of the city. Some of the other captives she killed, while some she gave to others as slaves of her followers. The remnant she left to pay tribute. Another less over-the-top account says, It was flaming arrows from her archers that burned the city to the ground. Which is probably true, but way less metal. Because when he sieged the city, so they had the walls of the city was there. They're sieging it. They said, fuck it. Flaming arrows into the place. It's on fire. And as the people were running, the gates opened up and the people started flooding the city. And they just fucking cut them down. Yeah. As they were running out. I but, like the other version better. It, yeah, the time, the time delay with the birds is way better. That's every time you turn around, there's different versions and stuff. But nobody, of all the stories I've heard about this, nobody ever says it was probably flaming arrows that they were using and not flying birds. But the people of the time, this is all, this is our national heritage. We are the Rus. We have to tell people how cool we are. Yeah. So this, we're going to, oh, the, the this Vikings. This is how we did it. Yes, exactly. It's, it's propaganda. That's all this is. But anyway, so Olga was the first ruler of the Rus to ruler of the Rus. Who rules the Rus? Who rules the Rus? Olga, she, bitch. Olga. She was the first uh, ruler to convert to Christianity, done in either 945 or 957. Again, dates all over the place. The ceremonies of her formal reception in Constantinople. So she went down there and went down to the Byzantines there. Uh, so they were detailed by um, yeah, the ceremonies of her formal reception in Constantinople were detailed by Emperor Constantine the seventh in his book the ceremonies following her baptism Olga took the Christian name Yelena after the reigning Empress Helena Lex Pena in fact I'm going to show you a picture it was done it was done in 19. Do you know 93. Constantine didn't convert until just before his death, even though it was still a Christian city? Constantinople? Really? Yeah. I didn't know that. Constantine the seventh? The, I mean, yeah, the uh, one who... Did the whole Christianity yeah. thing? Yeah. This is a painting of Olga that I found, and again, if you're listening to this, you can't see it, but you can if you go to our YouTube page. There's a painting somebody did, granted did in 1993. That's a Viking. Yeah. You look at her. Absolutely. It's like this girl with long blonde hair is standing there with this face. And just you look at her and you're like, yeah, no, that's that's a Norwegian ass kicker is who that is. I love that painting. One of these days, I will fucking find a poster of that and buy it. Yeah, that's super. It's beautiful. Really great painting. I can't remember who the artist was. I'll have to look it up. 
The Slavic chronicles add details to the account of her baptism, such as the story of how she charmed and out yeah, she charmed and outwitted Constantine and spurned his proposals of marriage. In actuality, at the time of her baptism, Olga was an old woman, and Constantine already had a wife. Olga was one of the first people of the Rus to be proclaimed a saint for her efforts to spread Christianity throughout the country. Because of her proselytizing influence, the Eastern Orthodox Church, the Rutherian Greek Catholic Church, and the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church call St. Olga by the honorific Isa Postales, which is equal to the Apostles. However, she failed to convert her son, Svintsilov, and it was left to Vladimir I, his son, her grandson, and pupil, to make Christianity the lasting state religion. During her son's prolonged military campaigns, she remained in charge of Kiev, residing in the capital, in the castle of Vishgoro, with her grandsons. She died in 969, soon after nice. the Penches siege of the city. As a woman and a grieving widow, she was expected to be weak and remarry. Instead, she became a ruthless, bloodthirsty killer. Whatever happened to the Drevelians, you ask? The last mention of them in the Great Chronicles occurred in an entry in the year 1136. They didn't make it another 200 years after she fucked with them. They became extinct. I mean... And she never remarried. Let that be a lesson to you. Don't prey on women because you think they're weak because they will fuck you up and burn your village to the goddamn ground. <laughs> And, you know, with her never remarrying, I thought it was because of how much she loved her husband. And here you it are the one going. It could have been a power play, too. And that's what and you mentioned. to prove, and like, I don't need any of you. Like, I don't want my sons in jeopardy. I want to ensure my legacy stays the way it is because that's my husband's legacy, which is also partially out of love, partially respect and loyalty to him and the safety of her sons. But that's the legacy she wanted to carry on with her lands and her, you know. All of that rather than somebody else's children. Do you think also she did everything she did as a power play to be like, don't fuck with us? Yeah, don't like, come after us. I mean, probably like when we both. Come, when we come and ask for tribute, you fucking pay. Yeah, I think it was, I think it was both. I think it was anger at uh, them for killing her husband and causing that to be an issue in the first place and for, you know, having the... I guess thinking they could rise up and do this, and then you know her anger because they she's a widow now. Boss her around, and, and then to prove like you can't tell me what to do, you can't boss me around, you can't take over and think that just because I'm a woman that I'm going to be so afraid of being without a man that I'll marry the first group of barbarians that come into my city because I'm going to want to be protected and. I need a man around to take care yeah, of me. Yeah, she's like, no, I don't. And actually, I'm going to kill all of you. I'm going to kill all your homies. Uh, I'm going to kill your backup homies. And then I'm going to kill you. And kill your fucking village. Yeah, I'm going to kill your whole village. I'm gonna and fucking kill you. I'm going to fucking cook you. And I'm going to fucking eat you. Exactly. And bring Christianity to Eastern Europe. Here's one of the things she did. She's the first person in the area to create um like kind of like a law i guess of how tribute was paid a paid like instituted it throughout the area of listen oh wow so things don't get fucked up in the in, you know the next time around or whatever so that's what she's really noted for doing so and because people thought maybe her husband was like doing some shady dealings with how tribute was being paid and then she came back and said you know this is why all of this happened. Let me go ahead and make sure that's never a problem again because now we have a law. <laughs> yeah. It's like, these are the way things are done now. July 11th is the Feast of St. Olga. So every July 11th, that's her day. I'm going to feast in honor of that kick-ass bitch, Olga. And what, what do you think she's the patron saint of? Because, you know, whenever you're a saint, people yeah, are like, St. Yeah, Anthony's like the patron of saint of something. lost souls or lost things. Uh, St. Christopher's patron saint of children. I don't what know. Is, she's a patron saint of widows. That makes a lot of sense. Totally fucking makes sense. Makes a lot of sense. 
So there we go. Um, my email, our email I address. Say Ewoks. Ewok patron, say to but, Ewoks. Um, <laughs> yours makes a lot more sense. <laughs> so. Uh, I was gonna say, uh, if you hear this on iTunes, give us a five star rating because it helps the. They've got some kind of weird algorithm. Their algorithm. Al- 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 algorithm. I keep calling it a logarithm. Algorithm, <laughs> Ken. Al- algorithm. You're gonna have to help me with these things. Email address is one kickass B. It's O N E, not the number one at Gmail. Write us. Um, go to realultimategeeks.com. There is a button there that says donate if you want to give us money. Yeah. We'll, we'll get up. We're going to have a Patreon something. going. Um, we're going to get set up on Instagram. Um, personally, on Instagram, I'm swearwolves. Under, there's an underscore before it. Swearwolves. Ken, do you have an Instagram? One um, real ultimate geeks might be on there. Okay, I think real I don't ultimate really geeks. Um, werewolves. Yeah, from what we do in the we, shadows. What we do in the shadows. Yeah. I just um, saw that a couple weeks ago. Yeah, yeah. I love I know that. It's been out so for like funny. Years it's or so whatever. funny. They're actually they're doing a TV show, but it's not the same. It's. Mm, I'm very. I was very excited, and I'm very not excited. Who's um, doing a TV show? Uh well. So they're, it's still the same guys, but they're writing it. They're not acting in it and it's set in America, but they're not using like new characters. It's the same characters played by different actors. Hmm. <sighs> Do you know who Matthew Barry is? Yeah. Oh my God. Nobody knows who this guy is. I thought one of the vampires was him. He's, I think one of the guys who's going to be in the reboot, going to be, he's going to be pay, playing Vladislav? Vlad, yeah. yeah, he looked exactly like Vladislav. Yeah, um, yeah, he's actually going to be him in the. I'm totally cool TV with that. Show. Matt Berry can do no wrong. I just wish they were. Since they're not using the same actors. They were using different characters. You that know makes, what I mean? Yeah, but seriously, Matt Berry looks exactly yeah. like that. And guy. there's also, I guess, going to be a a movie called We're Wolves about the werewolves from it. <laughs> we're wolves. <laughs> so pretty excited. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, swearwolves underscore swearwolves. Real, Real ultimate, ultimate geeks. geeks. Um, next time you hear from us, I will have details for you for an Instagram account. And if you like, you guys want to get cool content and help us make more cool content, we would like to have a Patreon where we can exchange our content for your money and <laughs> do more with what. I think could be a really cool idea, and I'm really pleased Ken yeah. is doing this with me. I'm I'm glad you came along because I couldn't do this by myself. Because you know, you're fun to work with. So are you. Well, thank you very much. Um, In fact, you know you are. You're one kick-ass bitch. Hey! Sound effects.